uh, you grew up in a, um, a, a really a legendary sporting family. Yeah. Um, what was that like? Um, <laughs> well, my dad was a guy who had an idea a minute. He really did. Uh, he was very much a marketing sort of person, a, a, a very loyal, very calm, but high energy kind of guy. And I think he set a good example. Um, I never heard the man curse or I never saw him lose his temper. I'm sure he had his frustrations. He was a very calm individual, but he was also very creative. And so um, it wasn't that I grew up in it. It was just like it was present. It was present. And the privilege of being able to go to so many different things, you know, mentioning going to Wimbledon and seeing Yvonne Goolagong when I'm a teenager and things like that. I think, so if she was 19, I was probably 14 or 15 when she won that. But but that aside, I mean, getting to go see Pele play in the World Cup or or go to a Super Bowl or, or go to the World Series in Detroit and see Mickey Lolich pitch against, Den or no, Denny McLean pitch against Bob Gibson, you know, in the 1968 World Series because the Chiefs had played in Buffalo the, on a Saturday. So we got to go to a game on a Sunday or it could have been vice versa, I don't know. Uh, but we, so sports was just part of our environment. I mean, through SMU, the, the college in Dallas, my dad was a, an alumni there. So we went to the football game. So we saw, you know, some of the great, they had some great teams. I don't remember all the players, but, um, but we, we just, it was just a constant stream of going to sporting events and, and getting to travel and do some really powerful life experiences. Mm. Did you know your dad was a visionary when you were a child, or is that something that you just became mindful of as you got older? I, I would say it was something that came through retrospective, just learning about, I mean, um, gosh, I mean, I had to work at training camp a couple of summers. I had to is not the right word. I mean, it was, you were dropped off at the college dorm up in William Jewell College in Liberty, Missouri, and go in there and talk to Bobby Yarborough. He's going to be your, he'll tell you what to do for the next month. And you just did it. And uh, you just did the work and uh, didn't, didn't complain. It was just part of life. You know, I learned how to work. I tell you that and uh, got to interface with what, what, what I realize now were some very young men, even though I was just a kid, but just those sorts of experience. I mean, it was just, it was just the atmosphere. It was just the world we were in. And it's, it's hard to describe it. You didn't, you didn't think of my dad as the, you know, a big creator in all of this or somebody that contributed so much, if you will. You know, I didn't think of that. So that was Chief's training camp? Oh yeah, yeah. And yeah. how old would you be? I think I did it in summers when I was 13 and 14, right? I know one after the Super Bowl and, well, they won it in night, after the 69 season and probably the next, the next, those two summers, yeah. Probably I was in eighth and ninth grade is what I think. And then, of course, your own sports life sort of takes over. And plus I was involved in music as well. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the winner of the AFC, she gets the Lamar Hunt they trophy. Do. <laughs> they do. What does that feel like each year? Well, it's nice to be have played for it the last four years in a row <laughs> uh, and, and won it twice. Uh, that, that's kind of cool. Um, it's, it's just an honor. I mean, to be, to be put in the same breath with George Hallis on the NFC side of things, who is really a, a legendary family, a legendary man in the, in the, in the whole history of pro football. Um, uh, the family, you know, owns the uh, Chicago Bears now and things like that. So it's it just a beautiful testimony to really what he what he was as a person. I mean, he really was a steward. You know, he he was well to do, came from a well to do family. Um, he got trained to be a geologist, but um, he, you know, I'll tell you what one word I use with him with my dad is earned success. And it's a word that um, I've been able to speak about that people want to make a high level of contribution and they want to earn success. Now, that doesn't mean they want recognition, but they want to contribute to the success of others. And I would say that was one of my dad's great qualities. If you just think about um, in pro football and just the opportunity for the African-American players, the AFL kind of led the way in that, you know, not the NFL did too, of course, but it was this opportunities that he saw. So he wanted others to thrive and, and to succeed and have success in their lives. And there's so many great stories about him just 
just helping guys no matter what with their lives and things like that. So that's kind of cool. I've heard you tell a story about um, his desire to have a team and uh, you're talking to different people and uh, why don't you walk us through how did that bubble up in him and, and how did that come to be? So to this day, one of his good friends is still alive. My dad's good friends. My dad would be 90 if he were alive today. Sadly, he died at age 74. So this, this friend, Tom Ritchie, is 88. I haven't seen Tom in a few years because he's, you know, things, life gets in the way. But he would come to a lot of Chiefs games even after my dad passed. They went to the Detroit Lions training camp as a group of young guys in 19... 55, and they, they wanted to see Bobby Lane, one of my dad's favorite college players, go in training camp. And apparently, according to Tom Ritchie, dad is standing on the sidelines of the training camp. My dad is 23 years old. And he goes, wouldn't it be cool to own a pro football team? Mm. <laughs> now, he just finished his degree in geology and things like that, and he was working in the oil and gas business. So flash forward a few years to probably 1958, I think that would be the right year. He's the Chicago Cardinals. Chicago has two football teams, the Bears and the Cardinals. Uh, it's the Bidwell family. And um, so he says, well, I'm gonna make an attempt to try to buy the Chicago Cardinals and move them to Dallas. I'd like to have a franchise in Dallas. What he was seeing so well was there were markets where this sport would really succeed it would really take off. Uh, Dallas didn't have a team. It's Texas. Football rules in Texas, right? Even in the 50s, right? So, but he, he, he tries to go in and talk to the family and several repeated attempts and finally meets with them down in Miami, Florida during a winter. And it, it just isn't going to work. Now, during this entire process, he has been making friends with a lot of different people uh, Baron Hilton would be an example from the Hilton family, things like that. So he had accumulated some names. But anyway, the meeting ends. He gets on a plane in Miami, coming back to Dallas. He asks for some stationery, American Airlines stationery, and he writes up a business plan for the American Football League. And he has enough contacts, so he starts to form the league. That's what he does. And, of course, that's a rival league. Um, the NFL knows they're quite serious because these are very wealthy young people. They really are. Um, my dad was a baby. He was, you know, 27 years old or something like that when he was really putting this, the wheels to this, uh, putting his energy to it. So in 1959. And so um, he forms the league. And I always like to tell this story. The Minnesota franchise was in the original AFL. Mm. And people don't always know this, but the NFL does a couple of things. They put a team in Dallas, the Cowboys, they poach the Vikings. So they, they start making some chess moves, if you will, to say, we're going to try to thwart this league. Well, what happens is um, the NFL does come to my dad and says, look, you're down to seven teams. We'll take four teams. The other three need to go away. And my dad, in a really great act of loyalty, says, no, we're going to go find an eighth team and we're going to play as the American Football League. And they do. And that's how we got the Oakland Raiders, who are now the Las Vegas Raiders. And I like to tell that story because the Raiders have always been a chief's nemesis. But it's sort of the determination, the grit, if you will, but that loyalty to the other seven guys, other seven teams that he had spoken with and kind of got it ramped up and got the business plan together. They started playing in 1960. And that is really one of the, it's a great success story. And ultimately it, it forced, if you will, a merger with the NFL. And uh, the league brought a different kind of style of play and things like that. To football, there was a lot more passing, things like that. But that's kind of the journey. So the journey was just really from sort of standing on a sideline, uh, watching a favorite college football player who's playing professional football and going, gee, wouldn't it be cool to have a team to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Mm. So, yeah. Where's the business plan that was written on American Airlines letterhead? It sits in the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio. So not terribly far from here in Cincinnati. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's amazing. My dad's uh, microscopic handwriting. <laughs> he wrote he microscopic, <laughs> tiny print. Wow. Yeah. 
Amazing. He is described by uh, many people as one of the first, maybe the first person to see the potential of football on television. Right, yeah. What do you remember about that? So my understanding is the year 1958, so it would have been two. Uh, it's the NFL championship. And the game goes into overtime. Johnny Unitas is involved, you know, the great quarterback. And he, he's watching the game and he says, my gosh, the potential for this to really reach a national audience. And hence the idea of putting franchises in markets like Dallas, like Houston, like San Diego, where there was large populations and large interest in sports. And that's that's where it kind of germinated. And and I think he, you know, he saw that college football was tremendously popular on television. And pro football was not eclipsing those ratings at that right. point in time. Yeah. So that was it was a championship NFL championship game that went it went into overtime as I understand it. Yeah. So would you have imagined that um, football on television well, even your father, if he if he understood the nature of football on television today, what would be his reaction to that? It's funny as you asked me that question. Um, so my dad dies on December 13th, 2006. For many years, he had lobbied to try to get the Thanksgiving games to have a different rotation than just going to Detroit or Dallas. The Thanksgiving before he was to pass, so whatever that would have been, late November, the Chiefs were on national television with a Thanksgiving Day game from Kansas City. Mm. So we're in a hospital room in Dallas. They roll in a TV. This is 2006. And his the dream, you know, he's in a lot of pain with pro late stages of prostate cancer. Great survival rate for, for when the, di the initial diagnosis of eight years earlier. He did a really phenomenal job of fighting it. They roll it in and we watch the game. He goes, I can never have imagined that pro football would have become this captivating for people. Wow. That's an 06. So, so since then, you know, it's just, it's, it's escalated to even, even more than anything. But I mean, he, his gratitude, I'll always remember his gratitude as he faced his final days for the gifts he got in his life. In fact, I remember praying the Our Father with him and asking him, Dad, are you ready? And he goes, I cannot have imagined the life that was given to me. Mm. You know, he couldn't imagine all the beautiful things he got to do. Um, and to contribute to people's lives. So he was about the other person. Um, I, I would say he was a man for others, but that I'll remember that watching in that hotel, uh, not hotel, the hospital room, he, he wasn't technically in hospice at that point, but it was kind of like that last hospital visit. And he chose ultimately to spend hospice, his hospice time at the hospital. Mm. He did not want to go home and do that. And I understand that the support and everything was there. Um, but just watching that game after lobbying so many years, like, it can't just be in Dallas and Detroit every year. Well, it still is, Dad. <laughs> so, but that was a beautiful favor that the league extended.